Hello, and welcome to Macro Minutes. During each episode, we'll be joined by RBC Capital Markets experts to provide high conviction insights on the latest developments in financial markets and the global economy. Please listen to the end of this recording for important disclosures. Welcome back to Macro Minutes. My name is Peter Shafrik, and I will be your host for the day. And the title of this call is Higher, Wider, Steeper. What does the bond market seller tell us? And bond markets have been pushing higher, and yields have been pushed higher, curves are steeper. And the question really is why. It appears to me that it's a combination of better than expected macro data, particularly labor market data, in combination with central bank communication that rates will be held around present levels for longer than previously expected. And that's leading to a repricing um, initially at the U.S. money markets that has started to unwind some of the implied rate cuts already, um, as well as uh, longer dated forwards um, generating then upward momentum in bond yield along the yield curve. Um, the risk at the moment is that that not only continues um, out of the U.S. market, but probably also um, spreads into other markets, most notably here in the European time zone where I'm sitting, where precious little of the rate cuts so far have been um, priced out, um, despite the same rhetoric that we get from ECB or um, other speakers. Meanwhile, I also think that we had um, quite a bit of lopsided positions. A lot of particularly real money accounts that we have spoken to um, have been sitting in long positions in the bond market and probably need to scale some of that back over the last weeks. Um, and I also think there is a fear of supply indigestion really getting hold. And that particularly last piece, um, I think, also leads to a development of re-steepening of the curve. And then just to add the final piece to the jigsaw, the developments in the yen market are also getting quite a bit of attention. Um, and um, I know that investors both in Europe and the U.S. are a bit jittery about this and the fears of Japanese yen intervention make the round, um, but also uh, worries about um, substantially reduced investments from the Japanese investor community. To make sense of this all, today I'm once again joined by a very notable host of RBC experts um, on both bond and FX markets. But before I go over to them, um, I just thought it is very pertinent, given the unfolding situation in the Middle East, to just share a word or two on what that might or might not mean for our markets over here. And I will draw a great deal on a call that our commodity strategists held just yesterday uh, with clients. First and foremost, though, I would like to express my deepest sympathies for everyone who is directly or indirectly impacted by the events. And personally, I also have to admit that I find it sometimes difficult to relate to market implications when you have to watch these horrifying pictures. But nevertheless, that's what we are here for today. So first of all, I would argue that the market direction that we have seen yesterday classic risk-off risk move, should only be sustained really if the situation becomes even more difficult and potentially spreads to other countries and across the region. That isn't necessarily um, a given that it's not going to happen, but it might well be avoided. Secondly, as our colleagues um, have argued in their call yesterday, the most direct implication for our market is through the oil price. Uh, we have seen an increase straight away on Monday, and it hasn't been really reversed in full yet. And the immediate question, I guess, to ask is whether Iranian barrels um, stay in the market and or whether Saudi Arabian barrels will be brought um, to the market in more quantity. The latter, of course, is made much more complicated by the fact that the potential deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia um, doesn't seem very likely to come to fruition now. Um, and again, uh, so that probably has after effects as well. But again, the key question to my mind is whether the situation can be contained in the near term or not. And given the severity of the situation, the market movements so far have been relatively limited. That all being said, back to the behavior of the market from the beginning. And as I was just saying, um, I'll turn over um, to our experts now, and I will start with Isaac Brock, who will speak about the U.S. market. Over to you, Isaac. Hey, thanks, Peter. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. sell-off and where we think things currently stand. So, you know, in the past, we've liked to break down sell-offs into three parts. 
the fundamental, the technical, and then what we call the aimless wandering. So the fundamental leg here began on the back of stronger economic data and supply concerns over the summer. That shifted to the technical post-September FOMC, where we had a hawkish Fed keeping buyers on the sidelines and longer-end yields breaking through key levels to decade-plus highs. And we think that, that the breaking through those highs put us into the aimless wandering territory. Uh, there's nothing left to cling on to in the form of support or past levels to look to, so the buyer strike has only intensified and yields have continued to push past what we see as fundamentally justified. The real question is, is where to now? So in our piece last week, we had flagged three potential catalysts that we thought could help trigger a reversal. One, bad data. Two, something breaking, including geopolitical risks, and or the Fed getting nervous about the long-end move and what it might mean for financial conditions. And the latter two of those have been borne out to some extent over the past few days. Clearly, emerging geopolitical tensions in the Middle East have prompted a flight to quality bid overnight, although some of that move has already retraced today. Um, it also seems that every day in the past week or so, we've had another Fed speaker come out and say that the long-end move might mean they're done tightening. And we've heard that from both hawks and doves, which I think is uh, especially interesting. You know, yesterday we had Lori Logan, who notably was the first to introduce the concept of a rate skip back in May. And she said if the move here in the long end is a term premium story, then the Fed would have less need to tighten again. And we subscribe to the, to the belief that this is a term premium driven move. Um, so while our call has long been that the Fed is already done hiking, um, the long end move and the recent Fed speak around this has only increased our conviction there. So from where things currently stand, it seems to us the sell-off momentum has been slowing. You know, 30s tested and rejected 5% twice last week, both times prompting a pretty strong uh, reversal rally. When you combine that with flaring geopolitical tensions and a Fed that's sounding increasingly aware that the long-end moves are doing some of the tightening work for them, we think the bias could begin to shift back towards lower rates or at least sideways chop around current levels rather than reducing the risk of breaks to new highs. Of course, with Fed minutes, CPI data, and long-end auctions all due this week, there's certainly event risk remaining. Um, and we think that race markets will remain jittery in the near term. Thanks, and I'll pass it back to you, Peter. Thank you, Isaac. Um, and for everyone who has not seen the note, uh, Isaac just omitted that uh, the title is extremely catchy, Knife Catchers Wanted. So please be on the lookout and uh, take a look for that. Um, I'll hand it over now to Simon, um, who's going to speak about the um, cat market. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, yeah, I'll compare and contrast the situation in Canada with the broader global mac macro picture around higher yields and steeper curves. Um, the first thing to note is that Canada curves have mostly steepened, especially 210, so it's gone from minus 104 to minus 77 uh, if you're looking at the swap market. But relative to the U.S., Canada curves are quite flat. So if you look at 210's core versus SOFR, we're at minus 27 beeps um, from a sideways trend really around minus 10 beeps through early September. So, uh, you know, general situation, Canada curves are steepening, uh, especially outside of the very long end, uh, but we are steepening less than the U.S. Uh, related to this, supply picture in Canada, not the same as the U.S. In general, GOC issuance has been focused on twos and fives, and even uh, especially on bills as well, while 30-year issuance has been especially quite light. So it's tracking to just $10 billion for the fiscal year, so it could end up a little bit higher than that. Uh, fiscal risks are present, so deteriorating GDP growth around flat in Q2 and, and tracking that way in Q3 do impact federal finances, and alongside we have the potential for additional spending measures as well um, from the center-left government. The possibility of CMB issuance, so Canada mortgage bond issuance, rolling into GOCs is lingering in the background as well, but it is far from a done deal at this point. So that program was recently upsized to up to $60 billion per year from $40 billion per year. Uh, so the overall picture has fiscal risks, but generally not as concerning and not as much upside um, to issuance as in the U.S. The higher for longer theme in Canada makes a lot of sense to us, and we have long argued against early rate cuts. Uh, we currently have a first cut in July next year, we will need to see better recent trends on the wage growth and core inflation side in order to get there. Uh, indeed, these factors are moving higher on shorter-term metrics in the most recent reports, and these are the biggest risks that could e even lead to the BOC delivering an another hike, uh, even as GDP softens and the unemployment rate trends higher. 
Next Tuesday's CPI report will be the last major release ahead of the October 25th uh, BOC meeting. Uh, with the BOC's own business and consumer surveys the day before the CPI report, providing very timely updates on the expectation side of the equation as well. And with that, I'll flip it back to Peter. Thank you, Simon. That's very insightful as always. Uh, we're moving geography now uh, quite substantially, and I'll hand it over to Rob Thompson, who's going to illuminate, illuminate us um, how the situation unfolds currently in Australia. Over to you, Rob. Hello, and thank you, Peter. I'll leave geopolitics aside for my segment uh, and instead give a more medium-term take on the Australian fixed income market. Um, to start off, I have to note it's been something of a passenger to other markets ever since the RBA's last hike uh, back in June. Uh, and since then, it's been four meetings with four on-hold decisions, keeping the policy rate steady at 4.1, including at this month's meeting where the new Governor Michelle Bullock took the reins. Uh, the accompanying statement was actually so devoid of changes relative to September's that the main message we took away is that Bullock was trying to make a statement about continuity uh, and avoid being immediately bracketed as more or less hawkish than the previous governor, Lowe. Uh, so the RBA has given us relatively little to play with lately on the policy right front. Um, but where it gets more interesting for markets here is how it's led us to price the Aussie curve shape relative to the rest of the world. Uh, our benchmark 2's 10's curve, for instance, remains much steeper than peers, uh, and in fact it only briefly went inverse at all, uh, getting to negative 20 basis points back in June and July briefly. Uh, at the moment it's plus 50 basis points, so well above Treasuries, GCANs, Bullens and so on, uh, which makes this, the Australian long end look optically very attractive on carry grounds. Um, but this comes with a bit of a warning. Um, so the front end element of this divergence makes a lot of sense. The RBA is not going to hike to 5%, we don't think. Uh, so short-end Aussie rates probably will stay lower for some time. But figuring out where the belly and back end of the Aussie curve shape should price is the million-dollar question here for us. Uh, so if we look at the Aussie versus US 10-year nominal yield spread, for instance, it's about negative 17 basis points. This is a much less extreme spread than at the front end, but we have been arguing for some time that this 10-year spread should move positive because the RBA is introducing additional inflation risk by keeping rates lower than elsewhere. Uh, and thus tolerating a slower to a slower return to in target inflation, uh, and quite explicitly doing so. In fact, um, if we break the ten year Aussie US spread into break even inflation versus real yield components, uh, Aussie ten year break evens are about twenty basis points higher than Treasuries, implying higher inflation over that time, which is reasonable. But we think that a bit more can be factored in on this. Um, but what this means is, though, given break-evens are above US break-evens, uh, it's the real yield spread that's driving this expensiveness of Aussie 10-year bonds compared to Treasuries. Uh, so the real yield spread has actually reached about minus 50 basis points, which is pretty much as big a difference as we've seen since the GFC. Um, we acknowledge it could go a bit further in relative supply dynamics, with uh, uh, Aussie bond issuance remaining very low versus a much more imposing treasury supply task. But the key point we want to make here when looking at these relative curve shapes is that when this real yield spread finds a base, uh, we then expect 10-year Aussie bonds to start underperforming treasuries again, which in turn will keep Aussie curves, we think, relatively steep uh, for the near future. Uh, that's all for me today. So back to you, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. That's great. A fantastic, um, great insight as always. And then last but certainly not least, I'll hand over to Adam Cole, who's going to speak about the FX market and potentially also about the implication, um, particularly out of Japan. Over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Peter. So, um, as Peter mentioned, there are two potential conduits um, from Japan into the global bond market conundrum at the moment. Um, the first via the private sector and the second via the public sector. So um, on the question of whether the, um, particularly the rise in the cost of hedging foreign bond positions is sufficient to discourage Japanese investors um, to the extent that they become net sellers of foreign bonds and add to the pressure on yields. Um, to the extent that that happens, I think it was largely last year's story. So in 2022, um, Japanese investors were net sellers of 24 trillion yen, $185 billion roughly, uh, of foreign bonds. In 2023, 
Um, they have, in six of the eight months for which we have data so far, been fairly substantial net buyers of foreign bonds, and that went on uh, right up to August, uh, the latest data that we just got this morning. So the liquidation, um, I think, was probably last year's story. What we're seeing this year is um, that Japanese investors have uh, greater ability and greater appetite for taking currency risk than is often perceived. And I think it's highly likely, given that virtually every major uh, G10 um, bond market is now negative yielding in, in currency hedge terms. I think it's highly likely a lot of that bond buying is um, unhedged and um, so is generating yen selling, another fundamental flow that's um, keeping the entrenched weak yen in place. Um, so I, I think in terms of the private sector flow, um, to the extent that uh, Japan contributes to the upward pressure on yield, that probably mostly played out last year. And then on the public sector, clearly there is a concern that if the Bank of Japan intervenes on behalf of the Ministry of Finance again, the counterpart to buying the yen and selling foreign currencies would be liquidating foreign asset positions, primarily U.S. Treasury positions. Um, and um, that is mechanically um, almost certainly true, but I think it needs to be kept in context. And the Bank of Japan's and MOF's objectives, I think, are strictly limited in terms of what they can achieve in intervening. Um, very little chance of them turning around the trend in the yen. Um, and this is not uh, a return to the early 2000s when the BOJ were very, very active in FX markets multiple times each week. Um, their, their objectives are much more limited in terms of slowing the pace of depreciation and managing volatility in the currency. So um, I, I don't expect to see um, the uh, uh, BOJ active in uh, the FX market at, um, uh, at, at a high frequency, um, though uh, intervention risk clearly as we uh, push up back up towards the highs in dollar yen is there. Um, it needs to be kept in context. And as I say, this is not a return to the early 2000s when the BOJ is there day after day. And with that, back to Peter. Thank you very much, Adam. So if I wrap it up here, we've clearly been pushing bond yields to very important levels. The question um, is whether we get some knife catchers uh, who would be willing to buy at these levels. But clearly the underlying risks remain, as also Simon has been pointing out, um, that we will get uh, more central bank action potentially, or at least sort of not the implied cuts and that um, the market has been pricing. And I guess over the next coming weeks and months, the strength of the underlying data is going to be one of the things that has to be watched extremely carefully and will be guiding us, notwithstanding the near-term um, geopolitical risks that we talked about at the onset of the call. With that, I'll close the call. I thank you again for listening in, and I hope to speak to you again next time. Thank you. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.